Well, thank you, John. Let's uh, turn together to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, and we'll be starting today in verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named, named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another about as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some of the women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe, and all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going further. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them saying the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon and they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread In many ways, the, the burning heart of this passage is in that very word. It's, we're not our hearts burning within us. And the question that that answers is this. How do you stoke the fire if your fire feels like it's going out? How do you stoke the fire so you burn brighter? so that you burn brighter in a culture that it, 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 God knows is getting darker by the day. We'll be seeing today that it happens through the Word of God. We focus on the Spirit in Sunday school. Here it'll be the Word. It happens when He breaks it open in our hungry hearts like fresh baked, baked bread. And as we take and eat it, it burns in us to shine through us, or at least it can. Now, wait a minute, you might be thinking. Back up a bit. Fresh baked bread. Where did that come from? How do we know the Bible's like that? Well, the Bible itself teaches us that, as we will see in a bit. As most of you know, last October was the 800th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and we've been continuing that celebration uh, through some teaching each month on Communion Sunday. But each month we've been celebrating some of the key doctrines of Reform theology. And this month we'll be, we'll be focusing on today on two of the five solis, which are the foundational set of biblical principles that are foundational to the Reformation. This month it'll be sola scriptura, which means the Bible alone, and sola Christus, which, as you know, means Christ alone. 
Sola Scriptura means that the scriptures are the sole and the infallible rule for our lives. They're the sole and infallible rule for faith and practice. Sola, uh, Christus means that salvation is attained through the atoning work of Christ alone. It means it's all about Christ. And we'll see today, we're going to deal with one just very, uh, one aspect of this multifaceted, of these two multifaceted jewels. We're going to see today that the two, in many ways, are inseparable. The scripture alone is the place where you'll find Christ alone. They're two sides of the same coin, because the word of the Lord is all about, as we say, the Lord of the word. And you see this in one powerful image in our passage for today. Luke 24, 35, where it says, They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. That's what we do whenever we go to communion in the breaking of the bread, and that's what we do whenever we go to the scriptures in the breaking of the bread. Fundamentally, we recognize him. Because it's Christ alone in the word alone. We're going to see today that whenever, that whenever you break this bread, whenever you break open the pages of this book, you'll find him if you have eyes to see, and that's all you need as he burns in you to shine through you by the power of the Spirit. It's like we sing, Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou dost break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page, through the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. Christ alone in the scripture alone. My spirit pants for thee, O living word, because the living word comes to us through the written word. This is a key doctrine of what we call covenant theology, which is at the heart of Reformed theology. And that is, again, very simply, that the scripture alone is all about Christ alone. Covenant theology teaches that you'll find the gospel and Christ himself all through the Bible. Each theological perspective has strengths and weaknesses, and this is one of the greatest strengths of covenant theology, which I am passionate about myself. It just makes sense. It's his word. And so you'll find the Lord of the word all through the word of the Lord. He, he is over and under and in and all around and through every syllable of it. And his spirit is the one who serves it up, every word of it, as he takes it and, and, and breaks it for our dining pleasure. And as he does, we too can recognize him. We can be rekindled by him in the breaking of the bread, whether we are in the New or the Old Testament. As he interprets, like he did on the road to Emmaus, to us, all, through all the scripture, the things concerning himself. He breaks it open like fresh baked bread. And as we take and eat it, it burns in us to shine through us. And how do we know it's fresh baked bread? Well, hold that thought just one more time. This is why it's one of the many things we're looking for uh, in a senior pastor, a man who, who, is, who is covenantal in his theology. Many don't know this, but the covenantal way of looking at the scripture was foundational to Norm's whole approach to preaching. Norm interpreted to you in all the scriptures the things concerning Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ. Your hearts burned within you when he opened the scriptures to you because he made him known to you in the breaking of the bread virtually wherever he turned. It's uniquely uh, those who hold covenant theology who pray that and who do that when it comes to the scriptures. Like the prayer of Hudson Taylor, one that I, I love. It says, Lord Jesus, you go to the word and you pray, Lord Jesus, make yourself to me a living, bright reality, more present to faith, vision keen than any earthly object seen, more dear, more intimately nigh than even the sweetest earthly tie. That's what this is all about. Ever wonder where Christ might have turned to expound the things concerning himself there on the road to Emmaus? Today I'd like to focus briefly on just one of the thousands of places he might have gone to, a place that for me has become a living bright reality that woos me to 
the word of the Lord. We've been seeing for several months during communion that when we gather on communion Sunday, we're celebrating the priesthood of all believers, which is another foundational doctrine of Reformed theology. And we've been unpacking that over several months. We've also been seeing that we are each individually temples of the Holy Spirit. And then all together we are uh, like logs in a fire, a powerful temple of the Holy Spirit corporately. Paul says that we are a holy temple to the Lord. And in this temple, there is a table. There's a table in uh, each of us uh, individually, you might say, because each of us are temples, and there's a table each month when we're all gathered together uh, corporately. It's the same table that was in the Old Testament temple. Back then there was a table for what they called the bread of the presence which was bread that only the priests could eat Christ himself talked about this table when the the Pharisees you might remember the story when they got on his case uh, for plucking wheat and eating on the Sabbath and he said have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence ever thought about that what that might be the bread of the presence in the temple of God, stood for the presence of God with his people. And you think, why would bread, of all things, stand for God's presence, for the fact that God was with them? Well, he had already compared uh, his word to bread. Long before this, Moses said, man shall not live by what? By bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's comparing spirit of physical bread to spiritual bread. He was saying, your spiritual bread is my word. And now, here in the temple is the bread of the presence, which stood for his presence through his word. And to make a long story short, in the temple where he was present, he was saying, I am most present through my word. When you take and eat of it, I am present with you and in you. How is Christ in the Old Testament? You can't count the ways. But here, the bread of the presence is Emmanuel, God with us. It means that Emmanuel, God with us, is most powerfully, most eloquently, most uh, intimately near through the bread of Scripture. Through every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, into the heart of man through the word of Christ. He's saying that it's here where he can be really near, where he can be more intimately nigh, as we read, than even the strongest earthly tie. Now, interestingly, God commanded that this bread had to to be hot when they laid it on the table. It had to be fresh baked bread hot out of the oven. But why? Why was it so important that he would command that they serve it up hot? Well, what what does hot bread do to you? What does it do, say, for your nose? It does what Julie's honey whole wheat casserole bread did for our noses all the years that we were bringing up our kids. I'm telling you, it was to die for like some of the bread you have made. We've tasted it. She serves up a recipe. It's a recipe from the Colorado Cash Junior League cookbook. It's designed for high-altitude cooking. It's hard to make good bread there. Just for old times' sake, Julie made it for Jordan after Ariel's uh, surgery for cancer uh, last summer. And I'm telling you, at a very needy time in their lives, it was like, for Jordan especially, the ultimate comfort food. I can smell it to this day. And that's what it would have been like back then. The aroma of the bread would drift through the temple. And through this, he was telling the priests something about his word. And every Israelite could smell it too as they brought their sacrifices and as they baked bread in their own, you know, their own tents. 
God wanted it to be like, um, I don't know if you've, you've seen those cartoons where this, the, this delicious aroma is wafting from a kitchen somewhere and, and someone has his eyes half shut and his nose is up and, it's, and he's following it, you know, with his nose. It's almost like he's in a trance and he can't help but like sleepwalk to the kitchen. It's instinctive. And so it was that he gave the bread of his presence an, ar an aroma that was to die for by commanding that it be served up hot. Because God wanted to do more than just, you know, call his word to mind symbolically by saying it's like bread, that man shall not live by bread alone. No, he wanted to remind them of it physically, you know, gastro gastronomically, you, you might say, in a sensory kind of way. Uh, on a regular basis. He wanted to make his priests and his people hungry for the bread of life every day. And so, to this day, it all has the aroma of Christ. And it comes as the Spirit warms up the Word like fresh baked bread with a pleasing aroma. And if you're anything like me, it can fill your heart like nothing else. It's like James Beard said, he was the great chef. I, I saw this quote at King Arthur Flower this week. It's on one of the windows where you can, you know, look through and watch them bake bread and they got these sayings uh, pasted on the windows. I just happened to be working on my messages there this last Friday. I didn't go there because they made bread, though that was the subject of this message. But no sooner do I get there, I look up from the table, and on one of the windows there's this quote from James Beard. He said, good bread is the most fundamentally satisfying of all foods. Another window says, all sorrows are less with bread. That's Miguel de Cervantes. Now, we might not all agree with King Arthur Flower that bread is the most, you know, satisfying of all foods. They obviously have a vested interest in convincing us of that. But I think that we would all agree that this is the most fundamentally satisfying of all foods, or at least I hope we would. And I think we'd all agree that there is no other food that is more necessary than what we have between the covers of this book. Augustine said, I am the food of grown men. He's imagining the scriptures talking to us. I am the food of grown men. Feed on me and you will grow. But unlike other food, I will not be changed into you. You rather will be changed into me. It's our necessary food. I think we would all agree that this is the ultimate comfort food, and just like the Cervantes said, all sorrows are less with it. All that is what he wants us to think of when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. We're saying, we're saying, serve it up, Lord, in our hungry hearts, hot out of the oven, like fresh baked bread. And as we take and eat it, it warms our hearts. It burns in us to shine through us. Now this can happen every day of the month when we're alone with him. And it's so important that he makes it visible for us too just like he did with the priests back in the temple. Once a month when we're all together, he makes the bread of the presence visible on another table the communion table, because this table also stands for what happens when we commune with him. The communion table is so rich with meaning, as, we, as, we, as we've seen each month as we celebrate it from a Reformation perspective. And this month we see that he makes visible monthly what can be a, a daily reality. Each month at communion, he makes visible what's available to us each and every day through the Bible. When you take and eat the bread today, it's kind of, it's, it's like a pantomime of what we're supposed to do every day with the bread that's in here. Because that's the bread of the presence over there. That's Christ in the Old Testament. 
He called himself the bread of life. He said, my body is true food. And he said, this is my body broken for you. So it can be broken for you. It was broken for you to be taken uh, into you. As through my word, I am taken into you. Powerful symbol of all that. As he reminds us, and we need to be reminded. What we do each month, what we act out at that table as we take and eat the bread, stands for what can happen at the invisible table that he prepares for us each day of the month. So, he prepares a table for us each and every day in the presence of our enemies, in the midst of all our troubles, in the place of quiet rest. It's, as we sing, near to the heart of God, a presence we can enter whenever we open the scripture. As we dial down, and tune in to him. When we come to him like Charles Wesley did when he wrote, From the world of sin and noise and hurry I withdraw. For the small and inward voice I wait with humble awe. Silent am I now and still. I dare not in your presence move to my waiting soul reveal the secret of your love. And through the word he leads us to the Father just like he promised he would. And so it's like the hymn that uh, is not in our hymnal. I wish it were, Father, speak your word again, because the Father speaks through him in his word. It's to the tune of take my life and let it be. Father, speak your word again. Come and share your will and way. Show yourself as now we seek. Read in faith and wait and pray. We read in faith and wait and pray. Father, how we need your truth truth to fix our minds above, words of promise, peace, rebuke, all our words of life and love, all our words of life and love. Come now, Father, shape our ways. We will use the light you give. In your spirit, serve and grow. Learn how love would have us live. Learn how love would have us live. You know, as I thought about it this week, it reminds me of a story I heard long ago, and by God's grace I was able to find it. It's a man who Henry Ward Beecher said was the greatest influence of his life. Beecher was one of the great preachers of the, uh, the, the 1900s. And this man who was a great influence in his life, his name was Charles Smith. He was an African-American who was a hired man on the farm that belonged to, Be to Beecher's father. He said, Beecher said, he did not try to influence me. He did not even know that he did it. And I myself did not know it until a long time afterward. But what he did was this. He used to lie on his humble bed and read the Bible. Unconscious that I was in the room, he would talk about it and chuckle over it. I had never heard the Bible really read before. And it was a revelation to me. A humble man being warmed and filled by the word of Christ until his heart burned within him. The great Puritan writer Thomas Watson summed it up so succinctly, as he always does. He said, don't stop reading the Bible until you find your heart warmed. Let it not only inform you, but inflame you. That's what Wesley Duell said in a book that he wrote called A Blaze for God. It's a great read. How do you blaze for God, especially these days as the culture darkens around us? Here's what in many ways is the bottom line. He said, saturate your soul in the word. Immerse yourself in the word from Genesis to Revelation. It is the most tangible means at your, at your disposal of entering his presence. Feed on God's word. Drink in God's word. Bathe your soul in God's word. Read it. Read all of it. Read it over and over and over until it penetrates the very fiber of your beings. You cannot be a person of God, ablaze with God, without being a person of the word of God. As it burns within you. If you are an authority on, an authority on anything, be an authority on God's word. If you have a hobby of any kind, make God's word your hobby. If you spend time with any reading, read God's word. Store it in your heart. Think on it and meditate on it. Memorize it. Dream of it. Apply it in your heart and life. Spend major time each day with God's word. It will feed you, nourish you, and strengthen you. 
Through it, he will enlighten, guide, and brighten you as the Spirit, through the Word, transfigures you into the likeness of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. You want to be a blaze for God from one degree of glory to another. The deception is it's just a degree at a time. It's so incremental that it doesn't seem like it's doing much, but it is. From one degree of glory to another, let his word burn in you, and it will shine through you. There's a kind of person whose faith and whose zeal for the Lord burns brighter than the darkness around us. There's a kind of person that the world needs most in this onrush of apostasy that we see in so many churches. There's a kind of person who stands strong in this, this, this swirl of depravity, this cesspool of depravity that's growing around us and that has swept up even many of God's people. What the world needs most in this present darkness are people of God, people of the book. More than anything else, we need people whose hearts burn within them. Who are burning brightly for him. Whose hearts burn within them. As by his spirit, he explains the scriptures to them. Let me close with this. <laughs> On another window at King Arthur Flower, it, uh, it says this. Did you know that we start baking at 3.30 a.m. every day? That's, that's pretty good, I guess. But did you know that he starts baking? Not just every day, but every time, night or day, that you open this book. Baking it just for you. King Arthur Flower, I'd say, eat your heart out. We have got bread. From, you know, from the King of Kings. And he shows us in all the scriptures the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And our hearts burn within us when he opens the scriptures for us who makes himself known to us in the breaking of the bread. Their experience there on the road to Emmaus as you think about it, their experience has become the, really, the gold standard for saints uh, down through the centuries for what can happen to us when his word stokes our souls. It's the gold standard of what can happen in us when he opens the scriptures to us, hot from the oven. And what all that means is this. It means that <laughs> that you'd be dead on historically if you, it, 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 if you sang, Bake thou the bread of life, dear Lord, for me, just for me, just what I need for this day. Give me this day my daily bread. Serve it up, Lord, in my hungry heart, hot out of the oven, the bread of your presence, the fresh baked bread of the King of Kings as I dine at your table. All that happens supremely at churches that hold the covenant theology as we seek Christ alone through the word alone. So let me close with an ancient supplication that does th just this. It, it, it combines the living word in a simple but powerful way with the written word. I've got it on the inside cover of my Bible. It's a supplication that is also like this, this resolution of intention. It's very short, but to me anyway, it's very strong. It says this, Ever may our souls be fed with this true and living bread, day to day with strength supplied through the life of him who died. Ever may our souls be fed with this true and living bread, day to day with strength supplied through the life 
of him who died. Amen.